for housing as a proportion of income than at any time since records began. And rights and security are being rolled back, which for people of my generation is a really shocking and disheartening thing to see my granddaughter facing a world that was like my mother was brought up in. That's the opposite of progress. Um, and we came together with disabled people's organisations to in the campaign against the bedroom tax. And that really taught a lot of us a lot of what we know about how we can build and strengthen organisation. And it seems to me, if we agree that while all the benefit cuts are vicious, and as part of the anti-bedroom tax and benefit justice campaign, that's what we always said, we need to stop all the benefit cuts. But obviously, the bedroom tax was front of people's agenda, so we pitched ourselves at it then we need to find the way of working that unites the widest possible forces and that can attack it at its weakest point. So if we're looking at universal credit, and I'm not, I'm not doing that because it's the only thing that matters, but because it's the juggernaut coming down the road to us, The delays in universal credit are vicious and six weeks, let, I know the media and the politicians have all talked about a six week delay. Where I live in, ta in East London, the council say 12 weeks is more like the average because the system is so inefficient and designed to, to be punitive designed really to trip people up and out of benefits. But I think people will probably be aware that when, if, as and when your universal credit benefits are sanctioned or undermined or clawed back, all of the money they take off you comes off housing benefit. <laughs> That's the benefit they use as the clawback point. And that is why evictions are soaring. And that is why, it seems to me, I mean, there are lots of other issues about the conditionality of benefits, about the way they're trying to force people in temporary, insecure, or short-term work, or doing less than <coughs> X hours. They're trying to force people to do more work. Um, but it seems to me that at this moment, if we were to say universal credit rollout is wrong, the way universal credit works is wrong, and we will fight it and demand that it stop, and alongside that we will say to our landlords and our councils and anybody else we can get hold of, we demand that you pledge not to evict anyone whose benefits have gone into arrears because of benefit cuts. I'm saying this because this is the way we attacked the bedroom tax and we got getting on for half of councils to give that undertaking and we got the, in the whole of Scotland and eventually the whole of Wales to say they would move towards that system. So we know this can work, and so I've come partly <coughs> to add this to the discussion as a way that we can meaningfully do something that stops people being made homeless because of universal credit. Thanks, Lenny. Okay, we're going to open it up to the floor. Thoughts and ideas that you want to take forward for campaigning ideas. You've heard from Eileen about housing, and it also needs to be said that when you migrate over to universal credit, and now, if, if you have a change of circumstances, change of address, your health gets worse, a partner leaves, you're in a new relationship, 
it's triggered as a change of circumstances and you will now have to claim universal credit. <coughs> when you claim universal credit, your housing benefit stops while your claim's being sorted out, which automatically puts you into arrears. Hence, I was also seeing the, the uh, eviction rate rising. Now, what the government is saying is you can apply for a loan to pay back the to for a stopgap for the rent you need to pay back. You have to pay that back in a six month time frame. Now, we know people who, as Eileen said, 12 weeks. We know of one person a universal credit claim is taking 10 months. So what we need, we know things are bad, but what we need is a hard fighting campaign about where we take the campaign next, what ideas we have to mount the resistance and to push this government back on universal credit. And a message cross party. We don't want it paused and fixed. We want it stopped and scrapped. Because inside Universal Credit, the Health and Work Programme and Roy Bard, a great mental health campaigner, can talk a lot about psychocompulsion. They're going to be targeting disabled people, mental health claimants, into getting back to work. And incorporated in that is the Behavioural Insight Unit, aka known as the Nudge Unit at the DWP. So coming up with a health and work conversation and trying to get disabled people back to work by book or by group. Incorporated in it is false treatment. So we need to come up with some ideas about what you think is important to you, where we campaign, and how we build the wider movement to get involved and help us, and help us build it. So anyone got any ideas? Please raise your hands. Oh, are they okay with being live streaming? Yeah. Are you, are you guys, Obi is live streaming the workshop. Is anyone okay? Mm -hmm. No, there's one person in the back of the room. If you okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, so one person. Is everyone okay with the workshop being live streamed? Obi, who can help with the live streaming? Um, so do you want to check out? Uh, no, I'm doing this one of those. Okay. And lunch is at one thirty, so we've got just under forty minutes, so we've got to come up with some concrete plans to feed back to the plenary. So can you say who you are and where you're from if you can? Yeah, uh, Graham Ellis uh, from here to support in Lancashire and Unison National Disabled Members Community. Uh, we need to really go back to the beginning. Um, I mean, I, I, I work in the area welfare benefits and the biggest problem we have with disabled claimants is the cost it takes them to get evidence from their GPs. GPs in my area are charging anywhere up to £165 for a letter. So immediately they've no access to that evidence, which again is a bad thing. DWP randomly still do send letters out to GPs, forms, but they're filled in really badly by junior doctors in the practice, not the doctor that knows you. And I, I don't know if anybody's accessed their records on patient access, but I had a 20 minute consultation three months ago with my GP and she summed it up in one sentence on patient access. So when these junior doctors that don't know you go and have a look at your, your records on the practice system, it says nothing. So that, that, that's the beginning. We need, to, we need to campaign on securing the correct evidence to help, to help us claim these benefits. Okay, anybody else? Can you say, Ian, if you are away from... Richard Atkinson, United Community Health and Ports, um, I agree with the public speakers that I think our absolute priority is universal credit. This is the nightmare that is depending upon all the same people, um, except those on a comfortable income, who are going to be safe. Um, and it's a nightmare that just begins with the six week wait, the six to 12 week wait, whatever it may be. There's far more to come. It's the abolition of severe disability premium, um, which is £65 a week. Top the income of hundreds of disabled people, I've seen the first people who would have got severe disability premium, not just yeah. um, yeah. um, sure. okay. um, so the average. Sure, it's okay, I'll just hear it. Of course, those who are most of them The sanctions, sanctions are triple on the universal credit, as a rate per payment. And they're going to triple increase further because universal credit is a sanction machine. It's got sanctions built into it. 
that's basically all going on to the principal, and they're going to affect, uh, when they happen, they're going to take away virtually all the income of many people. Um, conditionality, generalness, and so on. So the universal credit is this tool, is a central machine for um, attacking and disciplining poor people, and it's the central focus of what we need to do is propose universal credit. Well, one thing I will need to say actually on, on universal credit, on Saturday the 2nd of December, Unite Community have called a national day of action around universal credit. They have called it, Christmas isn't coming, universal credit is. They're asking to have actions outside job centres or in your local high street having street information stores about universal credit, what your rights are and make people aware of what um, universal credit is. <clears throat> it needs to be said to people online that also low income workers, part time hours, zero hours contract workers, you know, are also impacted by universal credit. Students, but if you've got a partner who's on pension credit, someone of and your partner's of working age, you're also affected by universal credit. And it has to be said, if you are in a relationship and the two of you are living in separate establishments, you will be treated as a joint claim because you are in a partnership. So that is important to stress. If you tick yes to the DWP speaking to your doctor on the online claim form of universal credit, they will have immediate access to all your medical records under universal credit. Make sure that when you get that online form, you tick no to them having access to your medical records because they will use your medical records against you. And I think it's important to stress for mental health claimants, because they are on the top of the target list for the DWP, that they are starting to change diagnosis criteria in mental health services. We've seen sweeping cuts to mental health services, and uh, we need to look at some ideas around that. And we're not talking about welfare cards. <coughs> welfare cards and the threat around those are raising the spectre under universal credit. So we've got some idea, we've got some thoughts around sanctions, GP letters, and going back to GP letters, we recommend that all claimants actually, when they go and see their consultant, actually ask to be copied into their letters that are sent to their GPs. So if you're not actually got copies of your letters, do ask if you're under consultants to get copies of your letters sent to GPs, and you can also ask for um, GPs do actually give you access to your medical records for £10 if you ask for a um, direct request to have a look and get copies. And we recommend you do that, but some GPs are actually making it a six week wait to get access to your medical records. Right, and who else wants to say so who you're from? And um, my name's Carlo, Carlo Salvatore, I'm from the One bit is a question and the other, uh, the main part is an observation, but I'll try and build something in. Um, what, what we need, is it the case that um, with universal credit making it worse, GPs are already under pressure, so we need to get them on the side, because that, um, we need to build part of a campaign so that the GPs understand because their workload is such that they may not even want to write letters. I know it's controversial, but they can't. Can I just say that GPs actually, it's not in their um, contract to actually write letters. Exactly. So that's why they are charged and under, we've had the Health and Work Programme that Ryan and I have done a lot of work around that the healthcare professionals are now actually working an awful lot with the government to collude with the government to get claimants back to work. Yeah. So you have, and that's where psycho compulsion is going to have to come in. But we do need to do, do an awful lot of work with the, um, against the BMA. There's Catherine at the back there, go on, Catherine. Catherine, I'm running Chronic Illness Improvement Project. I just want to add another aspect of the medical evidence issue, which is going to be really. Um, 
something that the university credit and under the health and work um, program is that they're going to make conditionality subject to your um, your work coach's discretion. So even people on, in the support group in BSA, um, you know, maybe have requirements or maybe facing sanctions. And so the only thing in between someone in the support group, for example, you know, having to do having to be facing sanctions will be a GP note to say that they are not, you know, um, they are not fit for work-related activity or they're not fit for whatever activity is being imposed upon them. So I can see GPs are going to be absolutely up in arms that not only do they have to write um, give medical evidence for, for WCAs, but also they're going to have to intervene with work coaches in job centres to say, no, this claimant is you're not kind of imposing suitable conditionality on them. So that's, yeah. You know, I can't see them being set. They're already, you know, charging and not happy to give medical evidence. What's going to happen when suddenly claimants are, you know, in the support group facing positionality from their job coach and they're coming to their GP to say, please help me, um, otherwise I'm facing sanctions. That, you know, that's yet another complication that's coming down the line. Thanks, Gavin. Martin, just want to go back. Sorry, Carla, you've got time to finish. Uh, yeah, it. I, I, did, I, I did have a question. Does anybody know what the, uh, if you have got a, a bit of work, which I kind of have, I do a little bit of freelance stuff every now and then. That's all. Uh, does anyone know about the situation under the universal credit about the 16 hours? Is it? Can it start off as less? Do they want you working as 24 hours a day? Sorry, I'm being flippant. Right. If you, like zero hours contract, if you're working, uh, normally the minimum on zero hours is four hours. Under universal credit, if you're working under 32 hours, they will then start asking you to increase your hours in the workplace. When you get to 32 hours under universal credit, Basically, you will not be able to claim universal credit because you're working full time and they think you will not need it. So if you are, like you, you know, freelance or what have you, you could be asked by your work coach to increase your hours or they will ask you to find another job somewhere else. And that's what they're going to, you're going to find a lot of people in that position. Even, even if people's impairment doesn't yeah. really allow yeah. commitment and work more than parts. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry, just a bit in answer to the question first. I mean, we've been live universal credit for well over a year now. Uh, yeah. There's no permitted work on the universal credit yeah. as there is under ESA income support. Uh, and it's true, uh, people that are doing, that have moved house or have had to go to universal credit have been told now they have to increase their hours where they've been doing committed work, yeah. where they've been doing committed work in the past. Um, and uh, any, any disabled person that's working, but working part time, claiming universal credit now, being told they need to still need to start applying for other jobs to yeah. increase their hours if they yeah. can't increase their hours in the current workplace. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to make aware is going back to the medical record, if you sign up to patient access through your, through your GP practice, you you can get your medical record, you specifically have to ask for it and you can print off what you like uh, without waiting for six weeks. But that leads to another thing and leads back to universal credit. We have about 3,000 contacts a month in my organisation um, and that's in a, a population of about 70,000. Uh, and uh, the big thing that's coming out is at least 70% of disabled claimants of universal credit wouldn't know how to use a computer yeah. if one was given to them. I have now people being sanctioned for not responding to their journal. They're yeah. told to go to a public library in front of everybody and access the universal credit claim. In, in my area now, failure to access your journal and respond is one of the biggest areas of sanction. 
Martin, can you say where you're from? 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 Martin, can you say where you well, we know the horrors of it. The thing is, the question now is to you guys, what are we going to do about it? What ideas have you got to take forward that we can actually start mounting a campaign against it? From a campaigning point of view and just fighting it, there's too many even looking at it, and I knew a bit about it, um, there's too many closed loops, like everywhere you go is a dead end. So we must campaign in the sense that at some level, there must be breaking the corner. Because there's, there's too many areas where it just stops. And what about if you're, if somebody, not me, if somebody works at all, and they can't work anymore, or they can't even do what they're doing because they need social care to work. Right. Can I just say, when you um, want to, can you raise your hand to ask Sorry. a question rather than shout out so we can get everybody in the room? Because there are people that haven't yeah. spoken yet. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you say, T. where are you from, please? Okay. I'm Ariane, I'm from Invisible, Women with Visible and Invisible Disabilities. I think we've I think with universal credit, we have to look if there are any exemptions. I mean, for example, with PIP or ESA, uh, with the face-to-face -face exams, that, I mean, there are exemptions that you can press for for being for be, for your case being uh, being judged on the medical evidence only. And I mean, if you if a face-to-face -face exam or home with home visit would be detrimental to 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 your health. I mean, there are these kind of exemptions in the current current system. I mean, they're not well known enough. I mean, even uh, CAB sometimes doesn't want to take it up. I mean, we've been trying to to get p women who come to us exempted from face-to-face -face exams Can currently. Can just so. add something to that? Under universal credit, we'll have the health and work conversation, mm. right? Every claimant that this health and work conversation is mandatory uh, and everybody before they go, when they go through the work capability assessment under UC, will have a health and work conversation before they go um, on to a face to face assessment. These will be mandatory with your work coach. Mm. There will be no exceptions, and if you don't attend the health and work conversation, it's a three month sanction. That needs to be stressed about what, where this, where we need to know more about the health and work conversation, exactly how that works and how we can get people exempted from it because it's, the, the charities were told that these, these were going to be voluntary, they were due, the health and work conversation is going to be mandatory and we have to attend at the job centre with a work coach and they're going to come up with a four step plan, what are your barriers to you working, how can you overcome them, what four goals have you got? And this is where your right to a private life is going to be impinged. Because they want to know, do you, do you have a social life? Do you see friends and family? What do you like to do? Do you have any hobbies? Mm. All of this kind of thing. They're going to want to know you inside out and backwards. And with your work coach, they're going to set targets. It's going to be how high do you have to jump, what hoops do you have to jump to get universal credit. And they're going to get you by signing the claim and commitment. That's the, that's the catch-22. The health and work conversation for disabled people is where we need to take a really close look at because that's mandatory and we can't see any exemptions with it at the moment. And that's before you go for a face-to-face -face assessment with Maximus. Okay. Mm. Yeah, um, Martin, can you
how um, how to fit into society. I haven't got a clue because that their that particular part of their lives, I have not had any, any experience in. I honestly think we need representation in parliamentary level. I mean, twenty percent of the population are um, estimated to have disability, yet I think there's only two MPs that have declared declared disability. So you're actually asking them to consider um, your situation and have no experience or knowledge of it. And even um, the Equality Act has been in 25 years or it used to be the Discrimination Act. But it, like, it's just been flaunted left, right and centre. I just I think we need someone to go through how how the and um, how the government are um, like disregarding an act of parliament. There, there must be a, a way of like trying to catch them, well, not catch them out, but question their motives. Right, anyone else got any questions, Joe? I wonder if the professional bodies that the people doing the assessments, I wonder if the professional bodies they belong to, whether it's a nursing body or the BMA or uh, the Society of um, Physiotherapists or something like that, whether they have a duty of care to the people they see and whether the people conducting these assessments are breaking those professional body codes of conduct. And if we can look to people we know within these organisations who are friendly to us to see if they can work within to Okay, I, I'll be um, occupied London, I suppose. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm just actually wondering about these, the one about the assessments. Are, are you allowed to actually bring in somebody who can record the whole thing, or can you have it on video, or perhaps the one about peop a lot of people don't even know how to use a computer, so. Yeah, the IT illiterate. I, w I was remembering the film I, Daniel Blake, and I do know a lot of people who have never even used the computer. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in some cases, I'm thinking even it'd be good to uh, document some of these people who are yeah. who actually don't have the capability, or even. I mean, I tried to use a computer in in a library before, and it was like I'm thinking, what that? It's like I had difficulties. I just gave up. <laughs> Or follow the climate journey with the yeah, exactly. one, one of those things. Or um, even just have individual videos, a uh, few minutes. Um, like box box. Yeah, like that. It's something we just post it up on YouTube and then people can just actually post it up. I mean, the clicktivism is very useful in this case. Yeah. So just get the information out there. Yeah. Can I throw out um, an idea? Mm -hmm. Um, it strikes me, even in this room of quite well-informed and active people, that there's still quite a, a lack of information about universal credit and what it's threatening. And I'm wondering whether, well, so that's one point. And the other point is that this is an issue where deaf and disabled people have lots of allies. 37% of children in Britain are now growing up in what's officially a poor family. So this is a huge proportion of the whole population who, and, and while there are particular things that affect deaf and disabled people, there's a big potential alliance to be made and that's partly how the government has been put under so much pressure. So it strikes me that one thing would be to approach some of the other groups and organisations, both the official ones and the grassroots ones, and maybe organise some kind of speaking tour, use I, Daniel Blake, get Ken Loach and other people to come and say, look, this thing that's in this film, you're now about to do more and it's not acceptable and it's not acceptable for people who are deaf or, or have disabilities, but it's not acceptable for anybody else, to sort of re-inject the energy back into the fight about universal credit, it seems to me, otherwise we're all going to go off into our specialist areas and we're all going to be flailing about mm -hmm. and looking at 
legislation or campaigns, whereas actually the Tories are in a very weak position. Even their ministers are being criticised in it, and we need to somehow create a knockout blow. <laughs> uh, just I agree with that. The um, starting point probably is what I'm seeing. Then you have spring one in your areas on December the second, which is the not communist day of action in the nation. Um, it's worth certainly having something there. Um, just to come back on the on the Tuesday. <coughs> quite nice work around the last last week actually. One of the GPs came up with an idea. Rather than providing a note, he's noted all the conclusions up on the patient record on the which is accessible to everybody, including accessible to people who can put down an explicit statement on the patient record. He's not available to work, he's not, he's not capable of workplace activity, etc., 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 et all put down on the patient record, which is very easier for the GP to what she can write an important letter and be accessible to the GP. So just a solution to the record, so they can put it right on the patient record. Yeah. Um, it occurs to me that if assessments are happening at assessment centres, then maybe we could be a bit creative about making sure that the staff can't get to work, the assessment centres don't function, uh, and the other thing is that perhaps there are a lot of hackers out there in the world who might like to join in with us and destroy the One, one thing I'd say to you about that, you, if an assessor can't get to the assessment, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. The thing is, the owners will go and hit the claimant and they will end up with the sanction and lose their money. And that can come back on us. We've had problems in the past where we've been accused of intimidating the staff and also intimidating the claimant outside the assessment centre. We ran a prolific campaign with Vatos around that. But I think you've got to be really careful if you don't have the assessor can't get to work. The DWP won't give a damn about that. They just got the claimant's money and then they're in trouble. So I think you've got to look at it from that angle as well. Not pouring like cold water on it, but you've got to look at that angle that it will be the claimant that gets hit and then it can make us look really bad. And we don't want that to happen. We want to empower claimants to know what their rights are and how they can fight back and join the movement, yeah? If you start, but the assessor doesn't get there because we know where assessors have been sick and not told, you know, not turned up and then the claimant's there, they're really ramped up to do the assessment and they go through hell and back. We don't want to put them through any more distress than they're already going through. I think that's got to be, we've got to be careful there. Look, we've got the budget coming up on the 22nd of November. Yeah? Anybody got any thoughts around what to do about uh? Another balls to the budget demo next week. Mm -hmm. Can you make sure this time that you've seen by the BBC? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How about the MPs have welfare cards? Mm. Stop their drinking. They don't even turn up for the potential vote. At the end, I know it's really scary. But this, this summit is to try and unite our movement and try and come up with some campaign ideas. The thing is, we're doing, Gail Ward's doing some workshops around advocacy to do some training around universal credit and get people clued up as to what universal credit is to help other people. There's one idea right there. To train people to be advocates, to help people who need support with online forms and things like that is one. Housing's another issue. We've got the housing summit coming up at the end of November here. If people want to get involved, and because housing is an integral part of universal credit. I know there's a lot to universal credit. The health and work program is another thing we're all going to get hit by. But we need to come up with some, we've got 15 minutes to come up with a couple of campaign ideas to take forward to the plenary this session this afternoon. So if anyone who hasn't spoken yet has got some thoughts that would like to share. Some of you haven't said. Some of you haven't said anything. Yeah, I think. Um, Can you say who you are? Oh yeah, it's Roy Um I think what I find worrying about what's happening with universal credit is that uh, although the charities are speaking out against it, the parties are speaking out against it. What they're essentially <coughs> saying is. The underlying principles are good, but we need to roll that while the difficulties are not dealt with. But the problem is the thinking behind it and what it's designed to do. 
And I, I think, you know, it's important that we examine all the different aspects of that. But for a campaign, surely the message is that we want an end to universal credit. We want a system that is there to meet the not to <coughs> use psycho compulsion and political psychology to force people off benefits. So, so, yeah. so I mean I think that if, if we're going to come together and have a message it is that the university kind of has to go all together. Mm. Yeah, yeah, as we get with the assessments and the assessments. What, what's board. everyone's thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean yeah. There's nothing wrong with one thing that's all. What's wrong is the way it's done. We need to be campaigning to get payments and premiums back to what we were with the legacy benefits. You know, I, I don't see anything inherently wrong in one claim, but the way the money's apportioned in that claim under universal credit is, is totally wrong. And we should be campaigning to restore premiums, everything back to what it was in the, in, in the legacy benefits, tax credit, CSA, everything like that. So when you claim your universal credit, you'll get your severe disability premium. If you get into or DLA, everything like that. So I mean, I think the biggest problem we have as disabled people with the one system for all, mm. is we are caught up in the conditionality. Yeah. We are caught up in all the stuff which, are, you know, I mean, David Gork recently said that sanctions are not working for mental health. <laughs> that rather than becoming more compliant, we're becoming less compliant. And that is because, you know, I mean, I have watched person after person go through that assessment process and their mental health is taken back enormously. And so, you know, that is the problem that the one system fits all, when it's based around conditionality and this myth that the way out of poverty is into work. Well, we have 22% of workers in poverty. You know, we're, we're just caught up in a, an ideological mess. And, you know, that's why I think we have to say it doesn't work for us, it's never going to work for us. That's, I feel that really strongly. Yeah. Anyone? Can I just say, just as a, as part of the discussion, that I mean, obviously you could go down the road of saying universal credit doesn't work for deaf and disabled people and therefore you should be exempted from conditionality. And you could do that and maybe there's a, the tactics you have to weigh this up. But if we're going to create an alliance that's going to beat it, then I suspect it would be better to say conditionality is wrong for everyone yeah. because it's having yeah. the opposite effect. Because it's not just existing mental health sufferers who are, who are being hard hit by these benefit cuts. Actually, the tenants movement is awash with people whose anxiety and depression is going off the top of the scale because their housing is under threat. And we need to find right. some way of I think that's, that's the strap line. Conditionality is wrong for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's creating mental health problems, not protecting them. Um, there used to be an organisation um, that I believe is no longer existing that was, purported, was pushing out a different uh, whole concept of, of benefits and was redesigning the idea of benefits to be supportive and healthy and uh, actually assistative to people who were receiving benefits to improve their lives. So I was wondering if we could come together in some way and create our own version of that as a counter message to say, look, this is the healthy way people stand behind this. And then the other thing is some of us may have come from um, religious backgrounds, which means that the churches owe us, a, in a sense, in their idea of duty of care. And we might not want to be part of those organizations anymore, but uh, their ideas about what care is and what's just can often um, be very similar to ours. So we could go to, for example, the Baptists, who we believe they've got uh, an idea of social justice in, in what they're doing, and ask them to make a public statement. And then we can maybe roll the campaign out amongst the religious organizations to get them, one by one, to come out uh, against conditionality. So basically, now we've got to kind of come back and sum up. You know, we've got the Unite, 
Unite Community National Day of Action on the 2nd of December, which is quite the springboard for starting some action in your local communities, street stores and job centres. <coughs> We've got the Kilburn Unemployed Action on Monday around the 80 job centres. And we've got the housing summit on uh, the 25th of November here around, um, which is going to be a UC workshop. You've come up with a line, conditionality is wrong for everyone. You've got a campaign right there, which unites low income workers, which unites disabled people. What do you want to go with it? Conditionality is wrong for everyone. Because it's going to be low income workers that are going to get sanctioned as well. And do you see that's important to stress as well? I think that I think as a scrap line that really works because if it frees universal credit, that conditionality exists in the legacy benefits as well at the moment. So I think I think I think that that's good because it covers if if, if a campaign's lucky to get a freeze, it covers the people that are still on leg that remain on legacy benefits. The thing is Labour are calling for a pause and fix to universal credit. They're not calling for it to be stopped and scrapped. What's the message going to be to Labour if they get in? Conditionality is wrong for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. We want it Fix stopped. it by all means by by scrapping it and starting again <laughs> or whatever we're going to call it. So I mean, it does seem to me um, somehow we need to combine this with some pushing organisations into doing some kind of agitating around the country. And I, I'm not suggesting that the people in this room should say we, we're all going to do it, but it, like with the bedroom tax, by create the alliances created locally meant that you could have campaigning in 40 different places um, determined by local groups, but that people made links uh, that meant the campaign could be effective and it seems to me universal credit is crying out for us to say no, in Manchester we're going to create an alliance of organisations and we're going to make this a, so embarrassing that, that the politicians all run from us you know, because that's, we've got to recreate that kind of environment What's everyone's thoughts? Can I quick? I think that we should definitely be united about this. Uh, but we also should remember it's not only about um, computers and information technology, whatever, but for some of us, and I'm distancing it from me, the same barriers that stop us coming here or, or doing anything or participating more fully are the same barriers that stop us physically going to a process. It's by a miracle that I'm here, because I, I can't normally do Saturdays for the social event, but it's not about me. Um, I, uh, the reason I'm saying this is that anything, any aspect that anybody can contribute to the campaign is valid. So if they can't get there, uh, they can use IT or Skype or whatever they want to use, whatever avenue, it's just as valid as being there. Or they can provide people with links while it's going on or that kind of thing. So I'm saying get involved, widen it out, do what you can do because people can't be there. Okay. Any other thoughts before we need to move on? Is something haven't spoken? Vicky? Um, I'm a Tory African Deepak, I'm an advocate um, in my local borough. I do that independently now because we lost the contract for advocacy with the charity that I was trained by. Um, to be honest, it's just more of a thought than anything. Is that I think, I mean, I'm seeing it surrounding myself as well that one friend has just, she's got severe epilepsy, ended up being turned down for ESA altogether, they didn't even put her in work related and she's been in support group for years as a result. And it's just, I think now at the moment, just we're all worn out because it's actually affecting the people that are trying to fight it. I think we've all got to a point where we're in tears or, we, or as an advocate, I see it. 
and I'm thinking that some of my clients can't even get access to carers because of the fact that the, you know, care, care contributions are so extortionate mm -hmm. that it means that they're left at home a lot longer on their own and things like that. So, I mean, one had to stop care completely, but she couldn't, she just couldn't deal with it. But I think, I think kind of the general feeling that I've got, it's, it's really a feeling, not a question. It's just that we're all so worn out. Um, and the only people that are fighting about this are the people that it's affecting. And it's trying to, I can't come up with ideas at the moment, but it's trying to find a way of um, putting in the people that it's not currently affecting, that it could affect at a later point. I think a lot of, I quote, healthy people who are not <clears throat> carers or are in the disability community or the deaf community, are obviously not aware really of just how bad the welfare system is impeding on our lives. Um, I mean, every single aspect of our lives is affected by this. And this is why I'm you know, a campaigner, but right now, because it is affecting our lives and the welfare cuts, and I know people, some campaigners have ended up on universal credit, and so literally losing the will to live, end of. And so they're losing the will to even campaign, and it's just kind of a case of, trying to pull in people that are not normally within that. And it's, I, I did have one idea in my head, and I don't know if it's already been forwarded at some point, to basically see kind of, um, oh, I've forgotten the word now, but basically see if your MP might be willing to live for a week on the income that you're on <laughs> as a disabled person or on universal credit or even for job seekers and kind of get in, perspective of saying, right, here's one week, this is how often you've got to look for work, if it's job seekers or if it's disability, then explain, well, as a person I use taxi, so you've got to use money out, you've got to use the money out you get out of your income to get taxis to go to hospital appointments and whatnot, but to try and see if we can challenge an M MP or several MPs to just for one week or even a couple of days to see how they would manage budgeting the amount of the amount of income that people get in general. They did that several years ago actually, yeah. had MPs yeah. uh, live on acclaimants, uh, money for a week or so and actually live in Living social housing that was actually done. I think uh, Michael Portillo was one of those who actually went. Yeah. Yeah. Look where he's now, not an MP. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, if I remember, remember right from the first episode, Michael Portillo thought that the something old pain was for one day. Yeah. Yeah. He went out and blew the lot on the bottle of wine. Yeah. And that was it. <laughs> that was his way <laughs> gone. He blew the lot. <laughs> <laughs> The other, the other thing, sorry, there's no idea at the back there. Can you say who you are and where you're from, please? Hello, Esther Nelson-Tomello, Disability Studies student at Leeds University. Um, just listening to the point that was made about you know, using the media, I think that it's essential in this day and age to use the media to forward any campaign. And I think like when you look at the hashtag Me Too, I mean, across the whole world, like everybody now knows what that is. So, as important as it is to try and get all these different organisations to come together locally um, to push forward the campaign, I think we have to try and use the media as much as possible. And also, I mean, look at using celebrities to push forward the agenda. The more that the public and everyday people are aware of it, because I think that, yes, it's good to focus on the fact that it's something that's not good for most people affected with it, but what about people who are not affected with it? Should they care too? And I think they should. So I think we need to use the media, we need to use celebrities, we need to use whatever we can to get this issue to be at the forefront of the nation's mind in general, and not just people who are affected by the issue. Okay, thanks. Any other comments, Vicky? Sorry, just one more thing while we're signing along here. Um, the, the one issue that I found, because I'm only recently become deaf, like literally over the past two years, and the one problem that I found is a lot of the uh, links that are shared on uh, YouTube, and especially from like Canary and very well known within the campaigning community, um, you know, who kind of independently um, share information and things like that to us, um, 
there's only one problem, and the videos that they're including, they're not putting in closed captioning or sub former subtitles. It's not reaching a deafened community. I'm not a BSL um, fluent. I actually use a derivative called SSE, which is uh, a different grammar altogether. And I think people are missing the point for a deafened community that it's not reaching out to this particular point. Also to the deaf community themselves, or people who have been who have a BSL as a first language, there is a lack of that too, a lack of information for them too. There's literally, obviously, we're not going to get help from DWP to say, right, can you get an interpreter to explain how you a uh, UC works for us, we need someone um, to try and translate for obviously the deaf community who are going to go through universal credit, how the system is going to work um, for them. Because the spoken information you've just given, I have interpreters here to let me know. Mm -hmm. But the problem is for the everyday person who's not a campaigner and just seeing the links on social media, well, they're less likely to share it within their own deaf community because obviously it's not accessible for them even. And it's the same thing. I never share videos if they don't have some form of subtitles. Okay. Mm. How, can I come on quick? Um, to finish I up? think we do need a, a user's guide to universal credit. And it seems to me the organisations at this conference could oversee the process of getting an agreed text that we could get out everywhere for the second say but it's just I'm thinking in my you know our tenants federation has had at least two meetings about uh, universal credit and the only handout comes from the council which is all right but it yeah a lot of these issues don't get covered mm. so about a couple of ideas we take to the plenary session this afternoon then if all organisations could work on, and they've got a time limit here, a user's guide around universal credit that we can hand out on street <coughs> schools and things for the National Day of Action around universal credit for the 2nd of December. So that it's a user's guide that's ready for all of us to access. With the hash with the line underneath, conditionality is wrong for everyone. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to get that leaflet out. So. Yeah, well this is something that we've, we've got to work on. The thing is, going back to the lady at the back there, we need a snappy hashtag that's going to be picked up on social media around universal credit that people will get like that. Yeah. And that is something we need to come up with and, and work on. We're working on a state in Uh Too long. It's too long. Yeah. I like Christmas isn't coming. <laughs> I mean, in the short term, yeah. Christmas isn't coming, is good. Uh, for social media, I had one a few years ago which was hashtag support not sanctions. That, that was going sort of around 2014, but I don't know. We need, I think if we can like come up then, here we go, user's guide for universal credit for the day of action in the second. Support the day of action on the 2nd of December with street stalls for what Unite Community are going to be doing. But I think we need to reach out to all our local organisations how we can unite them all up around the fight around universal credit, which includes housing campaigns, you know, the local trade unions, and um, but also grassroots campaigners. Um, because we're all doing the same thing in different ways. It's how we all unite it and then we kind of like share our skill sets but also preserve our energy for the wider fight to come. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the key. Mm -hmm. We need to finish there. That could even be the name of like an overarching organisation or like a Actually, what you said, conditionality is wrong, sounds like a good hashtag. Unfortunately, if you've used a hashtag before, uh, it's not going to actually be aggregated in, by Twitter again. So you, it has to be individual. Conditionality is one of those words. It's very I mean, like it's a, it is long, but at least actually 
it's unlikely to have been used before. What about no to conditionality? No, just... Mm. Yeah, and conditionality now. Mm. The welfare state is not well. Yeah. Uh, the thing with the conditionality is because it's the first word, so if somebody writes, types conditionality, then uh, the other ones would actually come up. Like I told them about um, some of the saying, uh, boycott Starbucks. I told them it would actually be better if you said Starbucks boycott, because if somebody writes, types Starbucks on Twitter, the Starbucks boycott actually comes up with it, comes up as well. No, hashtag no conditions. We need someone to feed back from the workshop today to the plenary <laughs> session this afternoon. Who'd like to volunteer to feed back to the plenary session this afternoon at the end of the summit? Don't all volunteer at once. <laughs> Don't point at me. Mm. <laughs> on the workshop. Mm. So, anybody? Can you take it? Don't all put your hands up at once. Well, I'm last evening, so I can't. All right, so what we're going with then, that we're going to come up with a strap line with universal credit conditionality is wrong for everyone. That there be, we want all the organisations to work together to come up with a user's guide, a friendly user's guide to universal credit that we can use in the National Day of Action on the 2nd of December for the Unite Community Action. Is everyone in agreement with that? Mm. Mm. I suggest the leaflet should not actually have a date to it because it's with that. I mean, I do yeah, uh, I do yeah, stalls yeah. for uh, the Green Party in Barnet and yeah. in Harringay, so I can always take them and you know give yeah. them out as well. Okay. So that's why I'll be feeding back this afternoon then. Thank you all. Right, lunch is served at one thirty. I think you guys need to need to go and go outside before the next workshop in another hour. Didn't yeah, you? and I think yeah. And everyone. Thank you to OB for live streaming and to all of you for coming. To all of you watching online, if you've got any ideas around universal credit you want to feed in that you're not in here you're not here today, please feel free to use the hashtag Disabled People Summit to come up with the ideas, D-I-S-P-P-L Summit, um, which you find under Inclusion London to do your ideas in. And thanks to everyone online watching and to all of you here today coming. Okay. Um, at the Housing Summit there is a session on Universal Credit and what we're hoping to do is feed what comes out of today into that so that we take some practical steps to be a united movement. But we've also got a protest on 22nd on Budget Day in Parliament Square. So if anybody's... Oh, what's that? 20, uh, on Budget Day, 12 noon in Parliament Square, we're having a... But we need action on housing. The budget needs to... OK. Are you going to have... Um, are the plaques going to be long enough that... Uh, the BBC cameras can't escape it. Uh, I don't think those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you guys. Speak to you later. I'll see you later.